Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Elevate Your Equity podcast, where investors with a special emphasis on couples begin, continue, and deepen their journey to financial freedom together using the powerful vehicle of real estate investing to do it. Today, we have Nick and Diane Giuliani, and these are successful real estate investors who are living in Indianapolis right now. They were from California, and they moved out to Indy because of all the success that they were having. Nick graduated from the USC Marshall School of Business and combined a passion for analytics and relationship building to find the perfect home in e-commerce sales and channel management. He works this full-time job at Facebook, and his strong performance has earned him the Distinguished Rookie of the Year Award in North America, back-to-back -back years for sales. Outside the office, Nick enjoys real estate investing and has begun buying and selling rental properties in recent years. And Nick currently has a portfolio of over 46 units and consistently looking to expand while helping others, investors enter the field. Diane graduated also from the USC Marshall School of Business and then explored a few paths and eventually found a long-term home in corporate recruiting, helping to build teams and companies one hire at a time. She loves creating great matches between talented people and teams who value them. And outside the office, she loves spending time outdoors, hiking, gardening, and taking her two golden retrievers to the beach or whenever weather permits. I'm not sure if that happens in Indianapolis very much. She loves traveling with Nick and looks forward to a future of lots of exploration and adventure. And with an eye on a more flexible future, she and Nick started investing in real estate in 2016. And initially, while she's been hesitant, she enjoys partnering and working on the backstage parts of that business. And this interview was awesome. We covered so much ground. We went all the way from how Nick was able to work with Diane to eventually get them to work on the same page and start building their relationship together along with the business. It was a great podcast. Absolutely. I 100% agree. Their energy is just so inspiring and their love for what they do really, it's just beautiful to see their synergy. And I agree. It was such a great opportunity to just listen to all of their wisdom that they had to share. Yeah, there's so much to take away from this, no matter where you are in your investing journey. Definitely but lots of talk about setting up processes and how important it is to do that, no matter where you are, and start thinking that way. And then they're a living, breathing example of how they can manifest all the success by getting those going. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on Nick and Diane. Thank you for coming on the show, Nick and Diane. It's great to have you guys here. How are you today? It is a sunny, beautiful day in Indiana, so I'm having a great day already. Yeah, no, we are, are absolutely blessed. Really happy to be on here with you. Yeah, thank you so much for being on. We're so happy that you're here. You guys have been crushing it, working really, really hard and making some very, very big changes in your life. And so let's kind of dig in. Maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about your story, where you guys came from, how you got there, and where you are today. Let's start with that. Yeah, I'm going to let you pick that oh, up. Oh, man. All right. So uh, the two of us met in, in college at the University of Southern California. Absolutely uh, awesome, awesome experience. We ended up living together for a little bit and ended up getting married in 2016 when we purchased our first home, actually, in Southern California, which was a house hack. And we've been pursuing our careers, both in tech. I work for a large tech company in e-commerce sales, and Diane works in recruiting and, and management for a large company. And uh, yeah, we've got pretty decent sized portfolio out here in Indianapolis of about 50 doors or so at this point. Did I miss anything? I feel like you were trying really hard not to say you work for Facebook. I think you should be proud. Sure. Work for I, Facebook. I work for Facebook. I work for Atlassian. <laughs> work for great companies. We're really lucky that both our companies have allowed us to go remote. So we've been able to keep our jobs while moving out here, which is awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys. That's great. So you guys are working a full-time job and you have over 60 units right now. If I, uh, I think it's between 50 and 60. The number changes a little bit by the day, but uh, in that general range at this point. Yeah, well, congratulations. You guys have definitely built something that's super impressive. A lot of people uh, give that a lot of weight because that's something a lot of people strive for. So congratulations for making that happen. Let's back up a little bit, though. Let's start talking about how you guys got started in real estate investing. Were you guys both working together for it? Or was there someone that was really interested in it and then other person that wasn't? Or maybe you guys can talk about that a little bit. Sure. So I can paint this picture. So it was October of 2016, and we were a couple days from our wedding, I think two, to be fair, it wasn't, you know, day of, 
And I'm in the middle of finalizing guest lists, dealing with last minute changes. And Nick's like, hey, do you want to go see a house? At which point I, of course, said no. Um, but Nick, I think for the past few months before, had been getting really interested in real estate, had had some frustrations at work and was getting into this concept of financial independence. We'd actually been listening, I think, to Choose FI, which was a podcast on that general topic. But Nick was further down the path than I was. And so we got back from our honeymoon and the house was still available. So we went to go see it. It was in Orange County. And we were really interested in this house because it was, a, it was a house hack opportunity and those are really hard to find. I don't know if you remember what I said when we were leaving that house. I think her exact words were, you're going to make me buy this house. <laughs> and I, I think that uh, that points really well to the story of, of our journey of getting into real estate, which was Nick diving in head first and me kind of reluctantly being pulled along. Um, Nick had a lot of reasons for wanting to get involved in real estate. And I tended to be the like, I really like having a healthy bank account balance person. So that was kind of the story of our general journey of getting into real estate. Yeah, I think, I think you pretty much nailed it. I definitely am the kind of person that jumps into it with both feet. And Diane is the kind of person who, who steps very slowly into the pool. And uh, it, it's been a really good balance for us. I definitely have kind of had my foot on the accelerator as we've been going through this entire process. And Diane is the one that's ensured that we've stayed solvent throughout the entire process. So it's been a, a really, really healthy balance. And it took a while, but Diane is now, I'd say 99% on board with everything that, uh, that we're doing from an investing standpoint. That's fantastic, you guys. Thank you for sharing. I know that that's something that probably doesn't get talked about a lot, but if you don't mind, we want to explore that a little bit deeper because there's a lot of people that resonate with this. There's a lot of couples that have, you know, one person is really gung-ho about it and they're the ones that are doing a lot of the exploring and saying, oh, how amazing the potential is. And then there's the spouse. There's the spouse that's uh, that's really kind of interested that the household itself is in order, right? And everything is staying in place. So maybe can you guys talk about like what that first conversation was like and, you know, maybe talk about the differences in mindset and how you guys went through that to help grow your guys' portfolio as it was happening? Yeah, I'm trying to, to think of a first conversation. I'm not really sure there, there was one. After we, we had a really tough experience with that house hack. So just to share a little bit more, we put every dollar we had and several we didn't into buying that property because it was such a good opportunity. And from the house hack perspective, it was great. We had dream tenants in there. We got a handyman and a police officer who are our first tenants. Like it doesn't really doesn't get better than that. Um, but the house itself was falling apart. So everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Um, and I won't get into the details, but we were really cash poor and a lot was going on. And so we were navigating that. And then at the same time, Dick came to me and was like, I'm going to buy this house in Indianapolis. And I was like, I don't really know if that's a good idea. And he was like, cool, well, we own it. And that was kind of where we were. So I don't, there were a couple steps maybe missed in that journey. And I think that's something we <laughs> actually worked on as a couple is like, what are the things that you want to be involved in? And what are the things that you don't? And to be fair to Nick, he had talked about this stuff at a high level. And I had basically just said, like, keep me out of it. I don't really like, I'm not totally bought into this. I'm not sure that I want to be involved. Now, I didn't know that we were buying houses, but that was to give him some slack. That was, that was how we got there. So I don't really remember our first moment in time. Well, you know, I'll actually, I, I kind of do remember some of the, those early conversations and it actually wasn't about real estate in general. It, it was kind of taking that step back and talking about, you know, we were talking about the Choose FI podcast. It was having conversations about what we wanted our life to look like. We didn't necessarily know how we were going to get there. You know, we, we had this vague concept of financial independence and the 4% withdrawal rate and all, all that stuff that you hear about within that community. And we were aligned that we wanted to have more time freedom. We didn't want to be beholden to our jobs. Now, I was willing to go out there and be a whole lot riskier than Diane was at the time, which you know was taking on a, a ton of debt, taking on the risk of, of real estate investing. But I would say that the, the key conversations we had early on was about goal setting and, and really aligning to, hey, this is what we see our life looking like in five, 10 years, and making sure that we're both kind of working towards that, that goal. That's great. That's great. Great, guys. And I think that that's always where everything should start when you're going off on this journey, right, is uh, getting together with your spouse to understand what the big picture is to, and get on the same page and buy in, right, that whatever the plan is, whether it's through stocks or whether it's through single families or multifamily or crypto even nowadays, right, 
like getting on the page on all of this, right? Like trying to make sure that there's an overlap in people, you know, you guys both understand each other and there's something that you're trying to achieve. That way, if there's mistakes or there's successes, you guys know how to handle them, right? Totally. I think that's something Nick has always done really well is help to paint the bigger picture. And from a vision perspective and where we want to be, I think we've always been aligned. The exact how, I think that that metaphor of like Nick diving in versus me wanting to put one toe at a time is is spot on. And occasionally that leads up <laughs> to some bumps in the road or just like a, a different understanding of what it means to say we're going to do something that occasionally leads me to feel surprised when maybe it's not totally fair. Um, but I do think from a, a vision standpoint, Nick, you've always done a really good job of setting that stage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you both for your just authenticity and just honesty with everything. Cause this is like real life, right? And you, you guys are both so inspiring and just such a breath of fresh air simply because you're, you know, there, there's such a, a Nick to highlight what you said earlier about like, you know, you have your gas in the accelerator. It just kind of painted this picture for me of like, okay, gas break you know, and both are needed and it creates a synergy. And you spoke about balance too. And I want to touch upon like, you know, you both still work like really busy W2s, correct? And Very yeah, I want to um, maybe ask you guys, like how do your current W2s, how do your skills transfer into real estate investing? And also how do you guys do it all <laughs> and keep it all together? Well, you know, I'll kind of take the, the second part first, um, but you know, if I don't answer, remind me, I'll, I'll get back to that first part. Uh, we don't have balance. Uh, and that, that's really um, kind of the, the key to how we've, we've accelerated so, so much over the last four years that we've been doing this is we both, you know, give 110% to our jobs. But then once we're done with the job, we try and step away and invest into, into the business, learning what we can, interacting with people to the point that I would say in a lot of cases, our real estate business doesn't feel like work. The two of us, we talk about it together. It, like it's, it's our time together is talking about, hey, thinking about buying this house, what do you think? What color, um, you know, what color should I paint the door? Do you want to go watch flip or flop so that we can get some ideas? Like things like that. We're actually, our, our business time is together time. So I, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a balance. The, the two of us are both extremely type A people. We are our drivers in every sense of the word. So we are really bad about being lazy and uh, not lazy, about resting and putting our feet up. And um, so with that in mind, uh, I wouldn't say that there's a whole lot of balance. We, we put a lot of hours in on a, a weekly basis. One of the things that I think has worked well for us since moving to Indy is both our W2 jobs, the teams, well, I support a global team. So there's no, there's no bad time for me to be online. I could work 24 hours a day and somebody would always be glad that I was there, but we both pretty much aligned to the Pacific time zone still. So we actually sneak some real estate time in, in the morning before we jump on to our W2 jobs around 10 AM. We tend to both be early risers, early risers, Nick naturally me because I've converted over time. Um, so we sneak some time in there and usually there's a little bit of time in the, in the evenings as well that tends to be more vision and philosophy and the mornings tend to be diving in the numbers, working with our VA who Nick's been diligently onboarding. So I think we are huge structure people. If, even if you look at our weekend calendars, you'll see everything's <laughs> locked out, including like this is time where we have to go not talk about real estate. I've had to budget that into our calendars as well so that it's not W2 or real estate 24-7. Yeah. And circling back to the, the first part of your question, which was how do our W2s actually, uh, yeah. like the skills in our W2s support uh, what we do in real estate? I'm in sales. I can put my sales face on and talk to, to just about anybody. And uh, I would say that that's definitely helped us uh, with our relationship building. And, you know, one of the things that I, I think is one of my superpowers is that I build systems around things. And that is something I have to do for work and I have to do in, in our real estate. I, I think Diane uh, was commenting uh, about this not that long ago. She was saying that, you know, it's something that takes you 20 minutes. You'll go invest 30 hours to build a system so you never have to do it again. And, and I would say that that's something I have to do within my W-2 and then also the real estate business. And that's what allows us to have things happen when we're not actively working on them. Any skills from work that, uh, that translate over for us? I feel like my W-2 job is very different from the work that I do in our business, but I actually think that's healthy. I appreciate that I have um, some diversity in the work that I do throughout the day. My W-2 job is a whole lot of diversity and I tend to be a bit of a, a firefighter at the moment. Um, and our real estate business, you know, if that was, if it was the same all day long, I think I'd get bored pretty quickly. So they're pretty different, but I appreciate it. 
Wow, great, great stuff, you guys. I think that the process orientation that you guys have is going to put you in places that you never thought possible. Um, I keep hearing that because I think the same way as you do, Nick, right? Like I'm, I'm willing to build a process out that will take, it takes me many, many hours to invest in it. But if it's one thing that I can check off the list or scratch off so that now that thing is taken care of and running automatically, for the most part, every once in a while, you've got some stuff that comes up, right? That means that you can, you can free yourself up to build the next process and start layering that on top of each other. And you can start building these, these amazing like layers of complexity to your business and anything that you do. And I can't help but think to myself too, Nick, how that translates so well to buy and hold real estate, doesn't it? Oh my gosh. All of this time, you know, like coming up with the actual process, like in, in you know, in, in the analogy, you spend all the time building like the, the systems. And then once it's in place, it just runs a lot like acquisition time. You and I both know that that's where we make our value happen, right? Is at acquisition. We have to do the reposition, right? If it's going to be a project that you have to take on and then taking the profits on after that. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and just to that point, I, I had a really interesting interaction the other day, actually, with, with the, the virtual assistant that, that I was telling, telling you about. I have essentially laid out all the steps that go into to buying, rehabbing, and then refinancing or, and or selling a, a property. And I very quickly realized as she was going through it, that there was literally only one step in the entire process that I actually needed to do. And I probably don't need to, but it's from a process control standpoint, I, I want to do it, which is paying the contractor. That was literally the last step that, uh, that I needed to be involved in. And I, I realized just how irrelevant I was uh, within our own business there uh, very, very quickly. It's definitely a sobering thought. Wow. Great guys, man. That's so cool. I definitely want to dive into that as well, but I also don't want this question to get lost as we move on. So Diane, it's clear that you're now integrated into the business, right? Mm -hmm. And when you guys first started off, it was more you like kind of reluctantly following, like Nick had this vision, he was kind of driving through and you're like, okay, you know, I guess I get the fire thing. I'm going to, you know, I'll support wherever I can. Now it seems like you're taking more of an active stance, right? What happened? Like, what was that? Where did that shift come from? Can we dive into that a little bit? Yeah. So when I think about how long we've been investing in real estate, sometimes when we talk, you think, you know, we've been doing it for the past 10 years, but it's really been about three and a half or so years. And I think what I needed was more time to really understand the concepts, see the model proven a little bit. And I just wasn't necessarily bought into running at the pace that Nick has wanted to run at. And in hindsight, he was totally right. Where we sit today, you know, we might have two, three houses if I was running the show and we're definitely in a better spot because he's a little bit more aggressive. But I think the first element was really just giving me the time to explore, to understand, to see things through and, and to slowly become more involved. So for me, it's just been more of a gradual progression. I started out and I took over the property taxes for Nick. I know more about the Marion County tax website than anybody ever should have to know, but that's how I dive into things is I become kind of a subject matter expert in an area and then I'm comfortable adding on. And so from there, I started to piece on our blog. And I think working on our blog actually was a really important step for me because I got to dive more into our business. And as I was trying to share with other people, I was learning and I was understanding. And there were these moments of insight where I was like, oh, that's really smart. I can't believe you saw to do that. And, and you know, Nick at, Nick at that moment is thinking, yeah, this is what I've been trying to tell you. Um, but I think there's a difference in me showing up with curiosity and asking questions versus Nick, you know, trying to push information at me. Those are two different interactions. So I actually think having those conversations in the effort to share information, but also to learn it myself was a big change in my attitude around what we were doing. And over time, you know, now that we've moved out here, I'm out walking houses with Nick. I've gotten pretty involved in the front end of looking at deals coming from wholesalers, doing deal analysis. And so it's, it's really been step by step, but I do think um, getting curious and starting to write the blog and asking better questions was a big step. I, I think one of the things that really got you involved in, in really thinking about it was there was a, a and, and there are thousands and thousands of real estate podcasts out there, but there's a, there was a podcast not too dissimilar to, to this one uh, that she started listening to where she, she actually heard a couple uh, going in and doing this business together. And I think that was really inspiring to her. And uh, well, that podcast really isn't around anymore. Love that, uh, love that you guys have this one going so that, uh, you know, similar, similar people to Diane can get that same inspiration. Yeah, thank you, you guys. And first, I know that Sophie has a question, but 
I wanted to first point out the fact that you guys are working together. And I wanted to acknowledge that because it could have easily gone a different way. You know, Nick, you could have pushed on the accelerator too hard and that could have led to more problems elsewhere. Like you, the whole thing would have shut down, right? You guys would have stopped eventually, like she would have put her foot down or vice versa, right? And so the fact that you guys were both willing to compromise and work with each other. So there's individual dynamics and then the dynamics of you. I just wanted to honor that because you guys did work together at each other's comfortable pace and maybe pushing the bounds, right? Of one or another person, but you guys are both happier and bigger for it. And you guys now have more trust in each other, which is, I think that's the whole key. First, I just want to honor that and say congratulations. Yeah, I think there's trusting the other person's competence and capability. And then there's agreeing with the approach that they're taking. And I don't think at any point in our relationship has there been a lack of trust or belief in the other person's intelligence, capability, work ethic. I haven't always agreed with the approach, but I've understood where Nick is the subject matter expert and trusted his competence enough to say like, okay, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And like, if you tell me you've got it, you've got it. And I think that's shared on both sides. So I would agree you, you've got to have that piece first. Yeah. Thank you both. And the burning question that I had indirectly of like, how did real estate investing maybe either continue to challenge or strengthen as the process was going on? And also, you know, part two of that question is like, what mindsets did you guys have to adopt to find solutions when those challenges came up? Yeah. I'm sure Diane has a, a lot of answers to this question. I'll, I'll kind of uh, lead it off. Real estate is hard. It's a whole lot harder than just going and buying a couple shares of GameStop or Tesla on, on the the Robinhood app. And you know, it takes a, a lot more work to to get you know a single unit, you know, a single single property. And we've made mistakes along the way. And there have been opportunities for people to take advantage of us, and that, that's happened uh, because of of lack of of knowledge, lack of experience. And it, in those moments, it would have been really really easy for Diane to get frustrated at me, to, to yell at me, to, to holler and scream, especially because she's the, you know, like we were talking about, you know, gas and gas and brake. And she didn't. In those moments, she, she stopped and, you know, she, she was allowed to have her emotions. They weren't directed at me. But then once that was done, the two of us are a team. And I, I would say that that's, that's been our greatest strength is she has been willing to allow me to screw up and help pick me up off the ground, you know, pick me up off the mat and get me ready for the next round. And so I, I just, I really want to acknowledge that because that's wasn't something she needed to do, but that's inherently who she is. I would say the only thing I would add to that is in every piece of our life, we try to have a mindset of growth. And I'm saying that instead of growth mindset, because growth mindset is kind of a, a different philosophy, which we both buy into. But when I say mindset of growth, what I mean is Nick and I are pretty much never satisfied with anything, whether it's our physical fitness, mental health, our marriage, our business, our W2s. The two of us are voracious learners, but also big experimenters. We're always iterating to see, I wonder if we can get 1% better in this area if we try it this way. And I think either of us might really tire another partner out. So it's good we found each other. But we, I think a mindset of growth and trying to always get a little bit better also gives you space to fail because you are, you know, that when you're trying to grow, sometimes you're going to risk where you are and it's not going to work. There's space for learning in this relationship. But I think the biggest thing is we are growing together and we're growing in the same direction. And that's, that's with our business and it's with everything else. Wonderful, you guys. Fantastic. Such an inspiration for those out there, right, who are just getting started, or maybe they're on the up ramp too, and maybe they're running into conflict as well. Hearing the example that you guys have laid out is going to be really, really helpful for them so that they can plan their map, right? They can, they can look forward to the future and see what you guys have built and use you guys as a positive example. So thanks for being that for us. I wanted to ask you guys, now that we're talking about vision, right, what is next for you guys? I know that the, the listeners already understand where you're coming from and what you've built right now, but what's next? Maybe you can talk about you know, the processes that you're setting up now and what you're looking to do in the next three to five years. What I'm most excited about is putting Nick in a position where hopefully at some point he can have this be his main thing. I think that is one putting the right team in place. So I think it was a big step for us to onboard an amazing virtual assistant who has already, I think, been an accelerator for our business, but also just a little bit of um, a teammate for Nick. And that's been really cool to see that ramp up. But at the same time, Nick is running our business 
pretty full tilt at the same time as being a pretty killer employee. And I, I don't think that's sustainable for us in our life and in our relationship and where we want to take things. So for me, the, the three-year vision and maybe even a little bit faster is what do I need to do on my end to put Nick in a position where he can have this be full time while I can keep doing the work that I absolutely love. Yeah. And, and just, you know, kind of from a, a business perspective, kind of the, the direction we're looking to go. One is obviously we want to keep grabbing, uh, grabbing more properties, adding to our portfolio. That's that passive income. But some of the stuff that we've, we've added recently to the business that uh, we actually think can, can be a huge help to a lot of people is one, creating turnkeys. Yeah, and actually doing turnkey properties for other people. We can't necessarily finance and, and hold on to every property that we acquire and, and fix up. So that's an opportunity to drive some additional cash flow for us, but then also help other people who are looking to find a more passive investment than some of the, the active uh, rehabs that we're doing. We're trying to raise more private money because that's an opportunity to help people who have money sitting on the sidelines or, or might be afraid of the stock market, might be afraid of crypto, things like that, that we can give an accelerated return. And so really, we just want to continue to, to grow the business because we believe that we can you know, do, do so much good for the world while doing well for ourselves. And then kind of the last piece, and it's something that you know we've been kind of bandying about a little bit. I don't think we necessarily have a, a full plan on it, but some type of more formalized coaching for people, some type of accelerator, something like that to help people get off the couch and, um, and, and really start, start investing. I already do that on a, a daily basis with a bunch of people, probably talk to five to 15 new investors every single week, but find a way to actually spend some, some more time doing that, make that a little bit of a revenue generator for us, but then just have the opportunity to invest more time into that. Cause that's what really lights me up is getting the opportunity to coach people. That's amazing. It sounds like you guys have a great path forward. I'm, I'm really excited for what's coming down the pike for you guys, both of you. And it sounds like you have a very clear direction. You know where you're headed. I think that's really, really important to have. So let me ask you too, taking another step back, what have your guys' family said about all this, right? I mean, you guys are from, you know, from the California area and all of a sudden you guys take off and you head to Indy and they see that you guys are now buying properties and you're still working your jobs. Has your family given you any feedback or how's it been on both of your, your guys' families? Well, both of our parents now own homes in Indy. Uh, they're both uh, investors out here alongside us. And I think both are excited and bought in. My mom tends to worry a little bit about the amount of leverage that we take on. She's got the finance muscle as a result of her W-2, but I think both are really bought into the work that we're doing. And I think speaking for all of our families, Nick's too humble to say it, they're pretty impressed by how much Nick manages to take on. And I think all of us, myself included, just sit back and kind of have some awe around the superhuman energy that comes out of Nick to do everything that he does and have the creative energy that he's put into building this business. Yeah. I mean, we, we've been really blessed. We've got incredible parents. Um, I'll, I'll give my dad a little bit of credit and, and my mom as well, that my dad, as I was growing up, we used to, to drive around when I was a little kid. And one of the things that he would always tell me uh, whenever he heard somebody complaining about their job is, you know, Nick, Nick, what do I always say? Own the business. And so for us, that, that's been something that, that has really been driving us and driving our growth is that we want to own the business, own our financial future. My mom's been an entrepreneur for the last, gosh, 20 years, maybe even a little more than that. So they've really shown us the path of, of, that we want to go down moving forward. So we've been, been incredibly lucky, uh, lucky in that regard to very supportive families. Now, the order of operations is important. We talked them all into this when we were living in Southern California, and they, they, that's when they started investing. I don't think that they would have been nearly as supportive if they would have uh, known that we were going to move out to Indy, even uh, even for a short time. I think that definitely uh, caught them off guard and, and isn't their favorite thing in the world. Everyone's ready for us to come back, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. We're well done, you guys. Sounds like you guys have really healthy relationships around you as well. And um, I think that that's a really important thing. What you said earlier, I just want to highlight because it was so well said and so brilliant, like the mindset of growth. And, you know, just wanted to kind of delve a little bit deeper, especially for our listeners, especially for young, new couples heading in this together. You know, what advice do you both have for those newbie investors that may not have it all together, may not have the, um, the groundwork to help them accelerate the way you guys have? Nick and I are both ready to talk over each other. We've got so much advice. I think 
I think the big thing I would say, there's two things. So I would say first is you do want to start at the vision point. So align on the vision and get to a place where you both have a reason that you're aligned on as to why you're doing what you're doing. I think when you're missing that, because quite frankly, I've had a lot of male investors ask me, what's the secret of tricking my wife into like getting involved in this? And I know it comes from a good place, but there is no like, how do I push, trick, coerce, whatever my partner into, into buying in? It's how do you start from a place where you're both aligned? And usually that's going to be the vision of, of what you're doing. And then I'll, I'll hand it over to Nick to dive in further because I'm, I'm pretty sure I know where he's going. Oh man, Diane's absolutely right. Um, you know, it really making sure that uh, that you've got your your vision aligned, but kind of going to the growth mindset is always be learning. I, I think that uh, there's a lot to you know listening to to podcasts and reading all all the books, but make sure that you don't focus too deeply just in, in the real estate. And I, I don't think Diane and I do that. You know, we we listen to marriage podcasts, we listen to to podcasts on the economy, we, we listen to a variety of different topics that make us better, well-rounded individuals. And then we share it with each other. If I listen to an awesome podcast that, you know, is a, about how to engage better with my partner, I send that over. But I also send over incredible ones if, you know, I, I hear about how to, to raise private money a little bit better. Um, and just making sure that you're sharing those experiences together, you're talking about them. It's not just something that you're, you're doing in a vacuum and that you make that part of your interaction with your partner. Yeah. And the only other thing I would add to that is make sure that you're your own benchmark. So it's really easy to look outside and to see other couples that you admire and that's healthy and you should be building relationships with people that are going to push you to strive for more. But at the same time, that is not your comparison point. And I think I can get into that territory really quickly where I look at another couple and say, look what they're doing. We should be doing that. That's amazing. But at the same time, their vision, their strategy, where they're trying to take their life, business, relationship, probably isn't the same place that you are trying to go. And so as much as we're happy to talk with people and share our story and talk about where we're going, we don't have all the answers and we're certainly not anybody else's benchmark. So my, my second piece of get aligned and then stay focused on where you're going and learn from other people and borrow the pieces that make sense, but they aren't your standard, you're your own standard. Just so you know, you're safe. Diane's not gunning for a podcast. Uh... So. It doesn't matter. It would be a collaboration anyway. That's yeah. the way real estate works. Yeah, absolutely. No, and, and that's something that we, we've just absolutely been um, so surprised by and something that, that was an opportunity for us early on that we didn't take advantage of until, until later into our investing is just how incredibly collaborative it real estate is. Uh, early on, I started off and I was an island. I did stuff on my own. I didn't talk to other investors because they were my competition. And I've quickly learned, uh, and thankfully over the last two, two and a half years, is that this is such a cool, uh, cool group of people. All of us have very similar goals, but that doesn't necessarily mean our paths are going to be the same. So we're not necessarily competing for the same properties. And it's that uh, that old adage, you know, if you want to go go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, and that that exists not just in a relationship, but also within you know the entire investing sphere. Yeah, and I'm so so happy. Um, both you guys just dropping so many wisdom bombs here, and just so happy that you touched upon the comparison point. And I wanted to comment because there's that saying, what is it? The comparison is the thief of happiness, the thief of joy. And everyone has their own journey. We can't compare where we are because we never know where the next person is. And um, again, I love how Nick, you said like, it's just such a, a field of collaboration and it's so important to help each other and grow and elevate and create win-win situations across the board. How and in what other ways are you finding that that real estate investing is surprising you guys? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that, uh, on a daily basis at some of the prices that people are selling their houses at right now. Yeah, it's been been pretty amazing you know, given given the interest rate location. Surprising. That's a good one. I think what surprises me every time I listen to a new podcast or read a new article is just how many different approaches there are. I tend to get very locked in the mindset of what we're doing. And it amazes me the wealth of space and opportunities there are to go out and create a positive impact both in, in neighborhoods and with what you're doing, but also to build a really incredible business. I continue to have my mind expanded by all the incredible work that people are doing in so many different ways. It's a good answer. I can't top that. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's good. There is no topping. It's there's no comparison and it's all win-win. So <laughs> I like the callback. <laughs> yeah. So I know before you guys move on to the technical piece, yeah. I, I, again, another burning question <laughs> is like, uh, you both kind of painted a picture of what your daily life looks like. Super busy, maybe, you know, like you said, balance isn't the, the best word to frame it, but uh, like, I'm, I'm really curious, like what are, you know, what does your day look like? And maybe you can like lift the veil for us so we can kind of get a better idea of like, what is a day in the life of Nick and Diane? Typical day in the life of, of Nick and Diane. Uh, usually, this is a good intro, most mornings we are woken up by one of two of our golden retrievers who decide that that 6 a.m. alarm isn't quite early enough and it's time for us to be on up. Um, usually Nick is, is the early riser, but um, both of our morning routines tend to involve, for me, it's, it's usually some meditation. For Nick, it tends to be more of writing out his goals and, and kind of centering that way. But we both usually start our days trying to center on what it is we're trying to get done. Um, not, not in that particular day, but in our lives and where we're trying to go. Um, we're both pretty fitness oriented. So both of us are going to work out in the mornings and start our days from that perspective. And then we dive into work. I would say for the next nine to 10 hours, we try to say hello to each other in there somewhere, but our, our days tend to be pretty busy Monday through Friday. And then we try to spend evenings having some quality time together. We'll, we'll watch the occasional show and whatnot, but um, meal times are definitely phones away, you know, interaction, Sacred time. talk with each other, catch up, figure out what's going on uh, in the other person's life. So that's at a high level, Nick. I don't know if there's anything specific you want to point to in a typical Nick and Diane day. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, um, it's generally uh, very, very similar to what, what you said, have the, the little bit of a, uh, a team meeting with, uh, with the assistant there in the, the morning before we, we really kick off the day. And then, yeah, dig in for a couple hours to real estate before diving into the, the W2. And I try and get a dog walk in there and, and maybe throw the ball a couple times for him so that uh, we can get some extra exercise in. So yeah, overall, that's pretty much a day in the life. Amazing, you guys. Fantastic. So thank you for allowing that visibility to come through. That's that's good stuff. I wanted to talk a little bit about what you guys do in terms of operations right now, because it's probably no secret or surprise that a lot of the people that are tuning into this particular podcast are looking for multifamily investments. Um, and you guys are actually in single family space right now in small multifamily. But I think that that is also a very, very powerful way to build wealth very quickly too. If I was a betting man, I'd probably guess that you guys may have tripled or quadrupled your net worth in the last couple of years because of all the real estate and all the equity that you've built. Uh, and that's definitely something that you can do by becoming very active. So let's talk about what you guys actually do for people out there, right? If someone wants to get involved with you guys, what does the process look like? And yeah, maybe you can just give us a little bit more clarity into that. Yeah. I would say the key thing that we do is we solve hard problems. And that's why you get outsized returns in real estate as compared to, to other asset classes, because it's an active business in, in most cases. So what we do is, is a variety of things. Uh, the, the easy option is the, the Burr approach. And for those who aren't familiar, we buy houses, we renovate them, uh, we rent them out, and then we, we re refinance, and then we repeat the process. And so that's a process where we buy something and that, that is has distress from a variety of different factors, whether it's you know, the financial distress from the owner, whether the, the house is in bad shape, doesn't really matter. We're going to find distress, we're going to fix it up, and we're going to add value that's greater than how much we have to invest. So that's been great for us. It, it's absolutely something that we do on a daily basis. The other thing that we've done several times over the years is that we find portfolios of single families or small multifamilies, and we take those down. And the reason that's a hard problem is because financing those is a pain in the butt. And um, most of the institutional money is going to the larger multifamilies that you guys are talking about. And so there aren't very many people who are interested, first of all. And then second of all, there aren't very many people who can pull it off. And so we find these portfolios that are distressed simply because the exit strategy is extremely difficult for these donors. We end up taking those down generally through bringing partners in and through using seller financing and essentially having empathy for everybody in that transaction and figuring out what everybody needs and getting a result that works for everybody. So those are, I would say are our primary two business actions kind of on a, a daily or a annual basis. Great. And I will say too, that you guys make it very easy 
uh, or at least you make it sound very easy, but I know it's not. Um, I know it's very difficult to A, find the properties, right? And get the price point to where everyone agrees that's fair. And then to, to carry out the rehabs. So maybe you guys can talk through a little bit about, I mean, not too much of your criteria, but maybe some of the things that you look out for when, when making those purchases. Sure. So we work with both wholesalers and we look for opportunities across the MLS. I would say last six months, it's been really hard to find anything on the MLS that lasts for more than two hours. That could be an opportunity. It blows my mind how fast things are going that yeah. look pretty scary. We don't have super firm criteria. I guess we have a couple. So we're trying to stay into, I would say, B-class neighborhoods, at this stage, maybe C plus, A minus neighborhoods are, are tougher for us to invest in, but great opportunities. I'd say we've, we've had our hearts hurt through having to evict tenants and having some really horrible things happen in houses that we'd love to move away from. So we're tending to look at houses where maybe the on-paper numbers aren't quite as impressive, but we know through experience that they're actually going to be steadier and generally better returns for, for us and for what we're looking for. So I would say we start there. We look at neighborhoods that we feel comfortable investing in. We feel like are going to be safe, nice family homes. And then we're looking for houses where we know we can add significant value. So my mindset around when I'm looking at Zillow, what I'm looking for has really changed over the years. I used to really enjoy looking at some beautiful homes, but these days, the uglier, the better. I'm looking for neighborhoods that are generally nice and then trying to buy the very worst house in the neighborhood, but we have a lot of opportunity to upgrade it. And we're lucky that we've built a really phenomenal team. So we have people we can ask. We can ask our property manager, hey, this is what I'm seeing the rent should look like. Does this feel does this feel right? And is this going to at least be cash flow neutral for us at, at the very you know worst? And then we've got a really phenomenal contractor and team where we can ask what's the rehab gonna look like? And if the numbers make sense and there's an opportunity where we can pull most, if not all of our money out and at least have it be cash flow neutral, you know, we're pretty happy. That's a property we want to take action on. And I think when it comes to working with the wholesalers, our goal is always to have it be a win-win. They should definitely be making money on the transaction. And I think that's a mental hurdle a lot of people need to get around. But for us, we're not asking like, what's the very cheapest you could sell it for? It's, hey, here's what we see. Here's our numbers. Here's our comps. This is what we can offer as a result. Like, does this work for you? And if not, that's fine. Somebody else is in this market. Somebody else is going to buy it. Yeah. No, she, she absolutely nailed it. What I think you guys will kind of hear there is we actually don't add a ton of value to the equation in, in the grand scheme of things. What we are are connectors. We connect the different people and through doing that, solve the problem. But we don't add any value by swinging the hammer ourselves. Um, in a lot of cases, we don't actually source our own deals. A lot of those are, are brought to us, although that does take a lot of time to, to kind of weed through and figure out what the good properties are. But our value add is essentially just acting as a connector for disparate parties and us just kind of acting as the center point for all of that. Absolutely. And, and being the coordinator behind all that is very much a skill. So I would say that your value add is in making the whole thing happen. There is definitely some value there because there's construction crews out there that really want to work, you know, and then there's agents that really want to sell and being able to pull it all together is very, very important. So I... I, I will acknowledge the fact that even though you said you didn't do anything, I would, I would, I would care to disagree with you there that you guys are doing plenty, if you don't mind. Well, I, I appreciate the uh, the recognition. <laughs> like work. Yeah, you're right. That's right. Yeah, awesome. Well, you guys, that's fantastic. I love that. As we're kind of like winding down here, I just wanted to ask you guys, like, what was the toughest moment that you guys faced in your business? Was there one? Uh, was there a point maybe early on in acquisitions where maybe something went wrong? Maybe you could shed a little bit of light on that if you're willing to share. Yeah, I can, I can go a couple of different directions with that. What, one of the, the lower moments of, of our investing career was uh, this one, one duplex that we purchased. We hadn't seen it, uh, ended up, I think this was our second or third property, ended up investing a decent amount of money into it. And I couldn't figure out why we couldn't get it rented. And then I finally came out here to Indy and went into the property and sat there and was basically in tears from seeing just the, the condition of the property. And I was like, man, I screwed this up. And it would be so easy for Diane to be mad at me in this moment. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a definite low point of my investing. I would say another one was we were taken advantage of by an individual and had somebody walk away with a decent amount of our, our capital. And in that moment, it was really tough for us. Both, you know, there was fear from us because a decent amount of money had been stolen. But then also, it was, you know, somebody we had trusted and we had opened our hearts to and, and 
had that that betrayed. So I would say that those were both really tough, tough moments. But I, I want to actually kind of look back and, and say that in that, that one duplex I was telling you about, we ended up losing about $5,000. I ended up selling that, that place because I, I didn't see it as an opportunity for us moving forward, given what we had done. But I learned a whole lot in that scenario. I spent $5,000 to learn one heck of a lesson. Actually, many, many lessons in that one. And so that, that's one heck of a cheap uh, education. If the other situation was, was definitely a tough one and is one that we're, we're still learning from to this day. But with that in mind, we ended up building some of the best relationships with, with some incredible other investors that we, we could have possibly asked for. We've been very lucky. Uh, and thankfully, it was actually brought to us by, uh, by our agent. It's two houses on one lot in this incredible neighborhood called Fishers. It's an A-class neighborhood, absolutely beautiful. Uh, we've got three acres out here and um, we've been incredibly, incredibly lucky in this scenario. We ended up buying it for $300,000. We've invested about $50,000 between the two homes, but that second home we're actually renting out as an Airbnb. Uh, so March Madness is happening right now. We are getting just absolutely incredible, incredible number of, uh, of reservations and um, the, the rents are just dumb in my opinion, but people are willing to pay it. Um, but yeah, so in this scenario, we're netting um, in a normal month about $2,800 a month on this rental. It would be about an $1,800 a month um, top line if we were just to, to long-term rent it. So we've been very lucky that we're, you know, we moved out from the Bay Area. We were paying way too much out there and we're essentially getting paid to live in this house uh, because we were willing to do an FHA and invest that, uh, that $50,000 into the property. Yeah, that's great, you guys. Another testament of your guys' problem-solving ability to figure out like, you know, where to double down and have a shared vision and be able to execute on it together. I think that's so, so important. And um, yeah, I just want to applaud you guys both on that. Thank you. So, all right, well, let's, as we get into the end of the show here, let's go ahead and move into our rapid round, oh, no. which is at the end. Um, did you, have you guys uh, heard these questions before? Uh, we, we definitely heard a couple of them. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you're prepared then. I think we're going to have to start mixing these things <laughs> yeah, up a little well, bit. Yeah, we need to start a surprise in and yeah. <laughs> our guests. So the first question is, um, what book has had the biggest impact on each of you and why? And it doesn't have to be business. I'll answer that one first. Uh, you know, the obvious choice is obviously Robert Kiyosaki and any, any of his books. That definitely had a huge impact. The one that's more recent that I actually think uh, is is a little bit better and a little bit more actionable is a book by Scott Trench. He's the uh, the president of Bigger Pockets. It's called Set for Life. That's probably my single most gifted book. I read it. I got a ton out of it. Uh, I think I've accelerated past several several pieces of it, but it is one of those books that is just foundational and absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to take it a totally different direction and point to a book that's called The Happiness Advantage at Work. And I think if you take out the at work piece of that, it's a mindset book around what it means to cultivate positivity and happiness in your life. And I think for people like me, quite frankly, who are pretty high stress and high anxiety, it's about how do you kind of set those things aside and pursue the right things and have happiness actually be your fuel for success versus expecting that success is going to drive your happiness. I think I'm a big mindset person, maybe a little bit more than Nick, and it's something I have to really cultivate and work on. So that was a big one for me. Oh, wow. That's excellent, you guys. Yeah, we're going to run out and get those books too yeah. now. <laughs> awesome. So second question is, if people wanted to emulate your success, what's the first actionable thing they could do to follow in your footsteps? I think put time on the calendar where you're regularly communicating and talking with your partner. If Assuming that you have a partner, you're talking about your goals, um, aligning on your vision and also making sure that the other person is aware of what's going on. I think um, Nick and I can work really hard and but we always have time where we're coming back to making sure that the other person's bought into where we're going and I think that's really important. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't can't top that by any means, but yeah, I mean, from from a high level, I would say continue to be a learner, always be learning. A lot of people get into the trap of analysis paralysis where they're just always, always waiting to take action. Be willing to take action. But then, you know, even even once you've taken that action, continue to be a, a learner. Always be willing to be a beginner. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Next question is, what small thing do most people not know about you? All right, I, I can 
take this one. We are big Marvel buffs. We absolutely love all the Marvel movies. We know that they're complete trash, uh, that they have no redeeming value, but gosh, we love all those movies. Uh, we just ended up watching the whole WandaVision. We, we absolutely love that and talking about the different theories and uh, just absolute complete nerds. I guess uh, I'll go in the same vein of, of sillier things that people don't know. Um, we'll do just about anything for good frozen yogurt. And that's maybe been one of the hardest things about moving to Indiana is people out here don't seem to believe in the power of good froyo. Um, so we have driven 40 miles out here to get to some frozen yogurt uh, and we will continue to do that. Oh, wow. Uh, Man, you guys are driven in both <laughs> your yogurt lives and your real estate lives. <laughs> Well, hey, no, we do use that as an opportunity to drive for dollars. There you go. That's right. perfect. It's a right to expense office. Love it. All right. <laughs> okay. Number four, how do you guys individually like to unwind and restore your own creative juices? I like to get outside. I, I went for a hike by myself this morning, and I think whenever I can, especially now that the Indiana winter is over, the more time outside walking, the better for me. Yeah, for me, it's it's definitely exercise. I like to go lift heavy things and drop heavy things and just kind of do that. That uh, allows me to completely disconnect and just be in that moment. I, I would say that that's helpful for me. Great, love it. Last question is, is there something special that you too like to do together? Well, I mean, easily going back to that, uh, that Marvel movie thing, um, but no, I, I think at the end of the day, we actually really enjoy going and walking real estate together and like pointing stuff out and, and doing that together, whether it's like the worst house on the block or going and dreaming big together. Um, I think we're, we're doing that tomorrow. We're going to go check out some awesome houses out here in Indianapolis that we can aspire to and continue to dream. So I would say, you know, dreaming together and, uh, and just kind of going out and doing doing stuff together is kind of the, the key. And it doesn't need to be anything fancy. Well said, you guys. And I'm just going to say subtly too, that like before, when you guys started your journey, I'd say maybe what, five years ago, um, if you were to speak to yourself five years in the future and your future self spoke back to you and said, yeah, we're going to walk property together. I bet uh, Diane is like kind of curling on the inside kind of <laughs> diane's okay with it as long as we don't buy anything that's <laughs> walk as many houses as you want just don't spend any money and we're good <laughs> that's awesome all right cool well thank you guys so much for being on the show we loved having you you guys have so much information and so much value to give we're so excited to see what's happening down the line with you guys and uh what i want to do is i want to give you a space right now to just open mic how can people get a hold of you guys and you know, how can people reach out to you? What uh, can you guys help them with? Yeah, absolutely. Diane writes an incredible blog up at giulianirealestate.com. I hope there are show notes because there are a lot of vowels and I screw up that Giuliani sometimes. <laughs> So yeah, she writes an incredible blog up there that uh, has a ton of information about a variety of different topics in real estate. You can also get you know a link to my calendar actually on that same website. So if people want to book some time with me or they can reach out at nick at giulioni.com. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, but I would say that our website's probably the best place for people to, uh, to get a hold of us. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Nick and Diane, so much for your time, for being here today. This was a blast. I had such a good time. Absolutely. It was the best. Yeah, this was great getting to know you guys a little bit more, um, you know, on a husband and wife level as well, which was fantastic. And for all of you listeners out there, if you guys enjoyed this content, please like, subscribe, or comment even, um, just so that we can get more engagement and the algorithm gods can push us up the chart so that we can get exposure to more people. We're always looking for that. Uh, if you want to learn more about passive investing, please reach out to us at elevateequity.org. There's tons of resources there for you for podcasts like this with great, great people like Nick and Diane here. So if you guys have anything else, let me know. Please reach out. We're here to help. And I'm sure that Nick and Diane are also available to assist as well on their website. So I think we're ready to go. So this is Derek. And this is Sophie. We're signing off. Take care. Mm -hmm.